Go to the book of James. That will be our, our next book of study. For Sunday, we're about to start new, new sessions in all of our classes, but here's the book of James. I haven't taught the book of James a pretty good while. I could tell by the notes I had. So I thought it would be good to go back and deal with it. And so I want to introduce the book of James to you out of verse 1. We'll find out who this author is and then something about his book between now and next time. The salutation reads, James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he tells you who he's writing to. He's writing to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. Greetings. It's primarily a Jewish congregation of converts to Christianity, what we would call Christianity. Uh, he's a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Say that little word, and, for those. I mean, it looks just like a normal and, except in the Greek language, we call that an adjunctive chi conjunction. And what that means is it's a link between two nouns. And these two nouns are interchangeably important. James, a bond servant, or maybe yours might, that's a doulos, maybe the word slave. A bond servant, that, that's, this is a, 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 a doulos is somebody under recognized authority. He, he recognizes authority and he submits to it. That's a doulos. James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's really interesting because of who we believe this James is. And he connects God. Here's what he's saying with a conjunctive chi, uh, with an adjunctive conjunction chi. He, here's what he's saying. He is saying that I'm a bondservant of God the Father and God the Son. Except he gave him he gave him a title name, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one of the things that the colonel used to teach that I found to be very important, he said in the New Testament, when you see the words Lord Jesus Christ, pay attention to what order they're in. I had never thought of that before. Uh, pay attention to that because these because names are important. But Jesus, we know from our first hour study, that's a name ascribed to him in his humanity, that he would qualify to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world in his humanity. He's Jesus the Savior. Uh, Christ, that's his messianic title. He's the anointed one to fulfill all the messianic roles, which would be first and second coming uh, out of the Old Covenant. And then the word Lord is the identity of him having gone to the cross, buried and raised from the dead, that is his title. It is his title forever. Um, let, me, let me take a look at something here for a moment. In Philippians, the second chapter, In verses 9 through 11, it, this is really interesting how Paul lays this out. Therefore also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name, which is above every name, that at the name, see, we got it, now we got a marker, haven't we? Are you with me? We, we definitely have a marker here. Therefore God highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, those who are in he heaven and on earth and under the earth. Isn't that interesting? Now, we, we know what he's talking about there theologically. And that every tongue, see, now we're, we've connected. We're still talking about the name, but now we're talking about the tongue. That every tongue, not just every man, 
not just every knee, right? Not just every knee, but every tongue. Uh, that every tongue should confess, watch this, that Jesus Christ is Lord. So that's a big deal. That Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Okay? Jesus Christ is Lord. So Bob used to say, uh, pay attention to the way it's used because that's the way, and then go back and look at the passage because the emphasis is on how, we, how the name is read out. In other words, if, the, if it begins with Jesus, pay attention to the humanity that's, that, that has been called into play in a very important episode in the plan of God. Or if the first name is Christ, then look for that within the, the context of the structure or the Lord. So when I enter into a book like uh, James, I go back to that old teaching that goes like, whoa, wait a minute. You got something here which is really big for James, because who is James? James is identified, and now I start on your paper, the author of the book of James is referred to in Christian history as the half-brother of Jesus because they had different fathers. Now, he's, he's, in the Bible, he's going to be called the brother of Jesus. But theologians refer to him as the half-brother to make a distinction between him and the virgin birth. Are you with me? So often, often theologians will refer to James and Jude, by the way, who wrote the book of Jude, are going to be referred by historians, biblical historians, as the half-brother to distinguish the virgin birth of Jesus from the, from the rest of the brothers. Um, and so, but here's my point. It's very interesting how James introduces his identity with his brother, his earthly brother is not what is the big deal to him. It's the Lord. His brother is the Lord Jesus Christ. But he doesn't tell you that. We would never know in this scripture that James is the half-brother of Jesus. He never dropped it. You know, the rest of us would have dropped that name in a heartbeat. That's my Bubba. And he didn't, and, uh, and he uses enormous titles here. He connects the Lord Jesus Christ with God the Father. This is God the Son. This is Emmanuel. I'm writing about Emmanuel. And so it's just kind of interesting. James was one of four brothers and at least two sisters because the word sisters in, John, in Matthew, the 13th chapter, if you want to look at his family history, look at Jesus' earthly family here for a moment. In Matthew, uh, 13th chapter, it's just two verses, but they're important verses if you want to know something about his earthly family. Let's say 1350. Uh, uh, a discussion came up about Jesus from Nazareth, uh, and, um, you know, where did this man come from that with all this miraculous power and wisdom and all that? Verse 55, is this not the carpenter's son? Referring to Joseph. Is this not the carpenter's son? That's the way that people recognized him in the community. Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Judas is, comes from Judah. Judas and Jude is the same person. James, so you got James and Jude. Judas, is, Jude is short for that. Uh, and then notice sisters. Now, they didn't name the sisters. We don't know how many, but we know we got at least two or more. Agreed? It's plural. <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, and two of these brothers, listen, none of these people, none of these people were believers until the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As far as being uh, followers and disciples and believing that Jesus was the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Okay. Uh, the second point of introduction to James is, uh, as Christian historians also refer to him as James the Just. When you study about this author, you will come up with his a title given to him by uh, Christian historians. They call him James the Just. And he, he, he bears this title out of the book. This was not what they referred to him apparently beforehand, 
but he got this out of this book. And he got it out of chapter 2, and when we get there a hundred years from now, uh, <laughs> we, we, you will have forgotten this, and so I'm going to tell you now. Uh, it comes from James, the second chapter, verse 24, and it comes from a whole section of James, the second chapter, that is probably what James, the book of James, is famous about, faith works, faith versus works business. But in verse 24, you see that a man is justified by works and by faith. And, and not by faith alone. It should be in there. James 2, and not by faith alone. A man is justified. And, and, and this is where he, his principle of justification is where James got the, got the title, James the Just. Here's the third point about the, the author of this book. According to Paul, James is married. We learn this from Paul in the, in the, when he's talking about this in 1 Corinthians 9, 1 through 6. In verse 5, he said, Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord, referring to James and Jude, who were a part of the apostolic, not because Jesus chose them, because they were gifted by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so that makes of interest, and then he mentions Cephas. So we know James, Jude, and Cephas were married. Uh, the fourth thing about the author is that we learn that he was a zealot, unbelieving Jew until after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Like... Uh, most in his personal, most in the personal family. We learn that from John 7, 1 through 13, where in the verse 5, John, did I say 17? John 7, 1 through 13. In verse 5, not, it says, for not even his brothers were believing in him. Okay? We know this, point number 5. Paul records that James received a special post-resurrection appearance from Jesus Christ. Many believe that was when he got saved, just like Paul did. You remember on the road to, to Damascus? Now, we don't know, but historians, we pick this information from historians. Historians believe that it was in this post-resurrection -resur appearance that James got saved, but we don't know. Okay? Um, could that be possible? Yes, because they have to Paul. Agreed? In Acts 9, it happened to Paul. So, but I'm just telling you what historians believe about that. Uh, that's recorded in 1 Corinthians 15, 7 in your Bible. The sixth point I make is Luke records that James was present with the disciples after the ascension of Jesus Christ. So let's go to the book of Acts. We'll go to the book of Acts in the first chapter, and we pick up this story. Sometimes this is missed because of the overpoweringness of the Christ, uh, his discussion with the disciples just before he leaves. And then in verses, the first chapter of Acts, in verses 9 through 11, he makes this, this exit and the angels come. He goes up in a cloud. The angels come back and they tell you why he went up in a cloud. And you will see him come back in the same way he went up. And it's so dramatic that... Uh, we often miss, until Pentecost comes, we kind of miss what it was going on in between that. And so here we are in the, fir in the uh, first chapter, and we're looking at verses uh, 12. And so after, the, after uh, he goes up in verse 11, then they return to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, that's where they had come from, and they returned. That is, and then he lists all these people. These are the disciples of Christ, his, his disciples who are now apostles. He goes through the list of them. I will not name all that list, but there you have it. In verse 14, these all with one mind were continually, now pay attention, this is our passage, devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Okay? That's important. 
that's, that's important to us because we're studying the book of James. So that's important to us. And so it, it's important that we see that. So we've kind of looked at a pro progression in his life, how his life has progressed. And so here's James who identifies himself. He said, I'm James. I'm a bondservant of God and a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the title he gives him. And, and, then he, and then he goes on in this passage and tells us to the 12 tribes who, are, who have been dispersed. Uh, and we'll learn uh, more about this when we come back next Sunday. Let me tell you three things in closing about James 1.1. One, one. Now this, th this is important to me, and so I'm hoping it's important to you. What did I see in this? I saw a great deal. I just want to mention three things. Here's the first thing I saw about James and the title he gives his, his connection to God. Listen, listen to, what James, listen to what James is saying. Listen to me. John 14, 6. No one, I mean no one, comes to the Father except through Christ. I am James. I belong to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. It was his death, burial, and resurrection that put me in a position with God and allowed me to be able to write this book under the inspiration and authority of God Almighty. I, did, I wasn't born into this. I was born again into it. Now listen, that's important. I wasn't, I wasn't born into this. I was born again into this. And so I, I, I see that to be significant and important to me. First of all, I see that physical birth from Mary, physical birth from Mary did not give James an advantage in the kingdom of God. It didn't Jesus either, by the way. It was God the Father that gave him the advantage. Mary connected him with the heritage through Adamic, uh, through um, David. You know, the story of Luke 2. Physical birth from Mary did not give James an advantage in the kingdom of God. John 3.3 3 says, you, you've got to be born again to see the kingdom of God. You've got to be born again to enter the kingdom of God. That was true for James. And you know what you have to see about the kingdom? The only way in is through the Son, Jesus Christ. What, what, what does it mean uh, to see the kingdom of God? Listen, if you don't see Christ as the entrance, if He's not the door, you've missed it. He is the door into the kingdom. Nobody gets in. Nobody gets connected with God in salvation apart from Jesus Christ. James didn't have an advantage because he's born into the family. His advantage came when he was born to get into the family of God. I see that as significantly important in James' introduction of his book. The second thing I saw was that the physical birth of James has no assets to gain the approbation of God. You say, well, he must have. It, listen, here's what people say. Well, it must have rubbed. Jesus must have rubbed off on him. I'll tell you what he did. It rubbed him, rubbed him in the wrong way. He remained an unbeliever no matter what his eyes saw. All these miracles and all this stuff with Jesus Christ is just my big brother. He never got it. Never got it. So his physical, the physical birth of James in, uh, through Mary and into this family didn't offer any assets to gain the approbation of God. And listen, he was a zealot Jew. There's no doubt. There's no doubt he was a zealot Jew as an unbeliever. You know, like Nicodemus. He was a zealot Jew. Carried his Bible around, you know what I mean? Did all the things he was supposed to do as a zealot Jew. But you got to be born again. Religion can't do it. Religion is not the door to God. It's the door to hell, but it's not the Lord. It's not the door to God. 
The only door to God is Jesus Christ dying on the cross, being buried and raised from the dead. There's your door into the kingdom. There's your door into God. There is no other door. There is no other door. Don't let the devil lie to you and send your soul to hell. By your unbelief. Listen, the third thing I saw was that the physical birth of James didn't have advantage in studying the scriptures as a brother of Jesus. Think how many Bible studies he set through marking it off. I don't believe that. 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 One of the sad days of my life is when a child goes through the system, he comes and sets in here, and then he checks me off, and about a year later, he's gone. You know what that is? That's a negative volition to the truth of the Word of God. You know how you snatch that kid back? Families. If families don't snatch him back to God, he'll never get snatched back. You let that kid drift off, you cut that, you let, cut that cord to Christ and let that kid s slide away, let me tell you, that'll be the worst day and nightmare of your life. Who's supposed to go rescue that kid? You. You don't let that kid cut the cord and drift off from God. Go out there and pull them right back in. Oh, you say, listen, he'll either sink or learn to swim. Now, how is he going to do that? You know what he's going to do? He's going to sink. He's not going to swim. Listen, he wasn't taught how to swim spiritually. That analogy will not work. You may have to have someone go with you. Get me. I'll go with you. I'll tell you, I'll go with you to get that kid back. Don't come to me and send me to get him. I'll go with you and support you as you pull him back in. Physical birth of James didn't give him any advantage to studying the scriptures as a brother of Jesus. It didn't matter how good his spiritual IQ was. It didn't matter how much influence was over him. He's got to make a personal decision. James, unless he is born again, will have no advantage to spiritual IQ. It doesn't matter how much he sat and, and much Jesus rubbed off on him. <laughs> you ever hear that expression, rub off on you? The only thing I ever knew that rubbed off any of bad stuff. I don't know about the good stuff. I guess it rubs off too. I don't know. But it doesn't help you. You must be born again. You want a spiritual IQ? It comes from the Holy Spirit. It doesn't come from the brain. It comes from the person. It doesn't come from your brain. It comes from your person of the Holy Spirit. Spiritual IQ. Li listen. Just look. Write this down on your piece of paper. 1 Corinthians 2.14 to the third chapter, verse 3. That's the difference between human IQ and spiritual IQ, and it tells you how it works. Okay? And you can read. I put passages on your paper for you. You can read. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25, 2nd chapter 14 through 16. I extended it to the third chapter, verse 3. Okay? Introduction to the book of James. That's where we'll be next Sunday. James. Jesse James. No, I don't know. That's All right, let's have a word of prayer, and then Rick will dismiss us with a pledge of the flag. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for all your marvelous grace, and we're excited about going into the book of James, looking at what James learned about law versus grace. Works versus faith. What will be interesting to see how difficult it was for him to walk out of one into the other and how difficult it has been over his life. And if the historians are true, what a marvelous death he had as a martyr. Boy, what we will learn about his death next week. Wow. Wow. And the converts that came from it. 
May we be those people. May we die with our boots on. Actively engaged in the things of God. Not sitting around whining and moaning and groaning and in some kind of retirement. You can't retire from the kingdom of God. There's work to be done. Life is not just about making a living. It's about having purpose and meaning in the kingdom of God. And Father, this is a work that needs to be done. There are people that need the gospel. There are people that need a word of encouragement from the word of God. May we be those people. Are we people with a vision for tomorrow? Or just a home dumb day that tomorrow offers nothing? May we have that renewed spirit in us like 2 Corinthians 4.16, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.